So of the delivery system, we've got the primary care, which is delivered mainly through who are for care. And we say GPs are gatekeepers for secondary care. The meaning is that um, they make sure that patients are treated at primary care for ailments she didn't necessarily go into secondary care. For instance, if uh, you spend half an hour with a GP, let's say roughly you might, uh, the government will be paying the GP maybe 400 pounds per, uh, per half an hour. Now, if it goes to secondary care, the same half an hour, the government is going to spend about almost a thousand pounds, for example. So when we say they are gatekeepers, they try and make sure that all cases that can be dealt with are dealt with in primary care so that you wouldn't be allowed to jump the queue to go to secondary care. So the system is such that the primary care is the first point of call for every ailment. So they are keeping the gate so that people will not flood with a simple ailment going to the hospital to go to consultants, which will be very expensive for the government. Right. So in 2013, there were 14,236 general practitioners and 7,962 practices in an average of 7,034 patients per practice and uh, 1,575 patients per GP. This compares with 41,220 hospital consultants and a further 54,000 hospital doctors in training. The number also, the number of solo practices is currently 1,404, while there are now about 3,537 practices with five or more general practitioners. Right. So if you look at the service delivery, the way they are organized, it is structured with primary care and secondary care and then the specialist hospital. So primary care deals with simple ailments and the GP will make sure that you don't bypass them to go to secondary care. Right. General practices are normally patient first point of contact. And people are required to register with a local practice. Uh, practice. So any resident in the UK is supposed to have a GP. In some areas, walk-in centers offer primary care services for which Registration is not required. It means that if you don't have any GP, you can still go into walk-in centers. And most general practitioners are private contractors and approximately 60% of them practice under the nationally negotiated general medical service contract. So they all have GMC contract and they are registered. Apart from the GP uh, practices, we also have outpatient specialist care. So if you look at the previous slide, we have general practices and we have walk-in centers. After the walk-in centers, we have outpatient specialist care. For NHS funded services, payment for outpatient consultation are made to hospitals by clinical commissioning groups at a nationally determined rate. Patients are able to choose which hospital to visit. The government has introduced the right to choose a particular specialist within the hospital. Most outpatient specialist consultations are carried out in hospitals, although consultation may take place in general practice. So in, in actual fact, is that GPs who will refer you to the outpatient specialist care. That is how the system works. And then we have the hospitals. Publicly owned hospitals are organized either as NHS trust, directly accountable to the Department of Health, or as a foundation trust that are regulated by Monitor, an economic regulator of public and private providers. So we have the publicly owned hospitals that are organized as NHS trust. They are directly at the Department of Health. They give them money and they tell them how to spend the money. 
or there could be a foundation trust who have a little bit of what autonomy upon what they can spend. So foundation trusts enjoy greater freedom from the central central government control and have easier access to capital funding and are able to accumulate surpluses or sometimes run deficits. So government wants all hospitals, including those providing mental health and ambulance services, to become foundation trusts in the near future. We've not gone there yet. So right from the beginning, we have the pharmacist, we have the GP surgery, we have the outpatients, and then we have the hospital sector where you, you will have some as NHS trust and some have developed higher into foundation trust. The difference between the foundation and then the ordinary trust is the fact that the NHS trust are accountable to the Department of Health. They control the money they use. They show them how to spend. But once it gets into a foundation status, then they have autonomy as to where their money will be spent. Okay. An estimated 548 private hospitals and between 500 and 600 clinics are in the UK. So apart from the hospitals that are NHS funded, there are also five and about 548 in the UK who offer a full range of services, including treatment, either unavailable in the NHS or subject to long waiting time. So if you thought that uh, you can't wait in the NHS trust, then of course you go straight into the private and whatever service that you can get, you can get. Of course, some services like cosmetic and bariatric surgery and fertility treatment are hard to come by in the NHS. So in that case, you can still go to the private and have uh, your treatment, right? So uh, public funds have always been used to purchase some private hospital care, such as mental health patients. So if you look at the structure that we have, we have the GP surgeries as the primary care, and the secondary care where we have the first point of call being the outpatient, and then we have the inpatient, and we also have NHS trust and an NHS foundation trust. And besides that, we also have private hospitals or in the UK. So within this structure, all healthcare policies are implemented within this structure. Right. Apart from the private ones, we also have mental health care, which is also an integral part of the NHS, including the a full range of services with prescription drugs covered under the same terms as the NHS. A less serious illness, including chronic conditions such as mild depression and anxiety disorders, are usually dealt with by general practitioners. But those requiring more advanced treatment, including inpatient care, are treated by mental health or hospital trust. Some of these services are provided by community based staff as well. Okay. Let's look at long-term care and social support. The NHS pay for some long-term care, but in recent years, payment has been substantially reduced, all because of the austerity measures and the funding cuts. But most long-term care is provided by local authorities and the private sector. And the full state support for residential care, for example, is available only to those with less than 14,250 pounds in assets, including the value of their house if they own one, who also have high levels of need, as said by their local council. So all long-term uh, care and support are dealt with all in the care homes. Right. A sliding scale applies to assets up to 23,250, with those above this limit paying for their care in full. So you could see that the system is not quite fair because people who are quite wealthy who have to go to the care home have to even sell their own um, houses to be able to uh, pay for their care. Right. Let's look at how it is organized. How the NHS, how the, uh, the health system in England is organized. Uh, those of you who joined the first lecture you could see the, the new structure of the NHS 
in the same that translates here. We have the parliament on top. The money comes to the Department of Health. And then we have the Health Watch England, who are the mouthpiece of consumers or service users. So if you are not satisfied with the service that you receive, and the NHS goes through the Health Watch England. We also have Public Health England who deals with health promotion and, and prevention. Then we have the NHS England in the middle. We have the Care Quality Commission at the right. They are there to make sure that the policies are implemented in a way that will ensure a good patient outcome. They have the right to close a hospital or a care home or every uh, service provider if you don't meet their standard. And then we have Trust Development Agency. Uh, and then the monitor. If down, if you look at it, the, 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 the diagram below, we have Community Health Services at the left. We have GP and other primary care contractors coming in, and then we have secondary care providers, NHS Trust, and Foundation Trust at the bottom. So every healthcare policy is implemented through these three uh, 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 branches. Below here, the actual practice is done through community health, GP, and other care contractors, and secondary care. But then the preventive aspect is done by Public Health England. All right, so I've shown you how the NHS, the healthcare system here is organized. What are the key entities for the health system governance? <coughs> how is the, the governance done? Uh, the Department of Health and the Secretary of State for Health are the ultimate responsible for the management of the health system as a whole. Now, the Health and Social Care Act, which came into force in 2012, which is a legislation, actually transferred important functions to the new NHS, including the overall budgetary control, and along with the monitor responsible for certain diagnosis related groups' rates for provision of the NHS. Uh, when we say that they transferred important functions, it means that they have given commissioning power. So NHS England has been able to commission some specialized low volume services such as practice factory, national immunization, screening programs, and primary care services, including general practice, dentistry, and pharmacy. And when I say commissioning, what I mean is that um, the commissioning uh, uh, before 2012, when the money comes in, GPs are required to use what the money is meant for. Now, after 2002, the CARE Act, GPs have been given the commissioning powers to look at the areas that are important to them that they can spend the money on. So if before 2012, maybe 10% goes into prevention, 10% goes into diabetes, 10% goes to lung diseases, 10% goes to smoking cessation, for instance, after commissioning. Every surgery has the right to look at where most of the money will be spent, depending on the problem in the catchment area of the GP surgery. So if the GP surgery in central Manchester has um, smoking as the main problem, they are allowed to use 50% of their budget on smoking cessation is the main difference between commissioning and non-commissioning. So before 2012, they were not allowed to commission. They have no powers. Whatever allocation that has been given to them to spend the money on, they have to stick by that. But as soon as the CARE Act came in in 2012, surgeons were given commissioning powers so that they have the right to use the money to where they think is needed. Again, another institution that actually helped implementation of the policies 
health policies is the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. What they do is to review scientific literature, published articles, and come out with the right guidelines for equipment and to be able to appraise new health technologies, their efficacy and cost effectiveness. So before 2012, NICE wasn't empowered as part of the implementation. But post-2012, NICE as an institution is commissioned to make sure that they provide the guidelines for treatment. And then post-2012, we also get the Care Quality Commission, which has been empowered to make sure that they ensure that standards are met so that um, patients will receive the best outcome. So the CQ still have got the right to close any home or any hospital or any GP surgery if they are not operating to standards. So you could see that after 2012 Care Act, so many actors came into the provision of healthcare implementation of the policies, including the Health Watch. As, as far as uh, the, the monitoring group, which is the CQC, and the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, they are all now part of the implementation of health policy in England. All right. The monitor is responsible for authorizing NHS Trust to become foundation trust and for monitoring their finances with powers to intervene if performance deteriorates significantly. So the 2012 Act extended the monitor's role to being the economic regulator of public and private providers. It licenses all providers of the NHS funded care and may investigate potential breaches of NHS operation and competition rules, as well as investigating mergers involving NHS financing trusts. So in addition to its role in supervising clinical commissioning groups and direct commissioning of specialist care, the NHS England is responsible for setting the strategies, strategic directions of health information technology, including development of online service to book appointments, setting of quality standards for electronic medical record keeping and prescribing and commissioning of the NHS IT infrastructure. All right. The 2012 Act also established a new national body, which I've already mentioned, the Health Watch England, which was not there before 2012. They promote interest patients and to establish health watches in each locality. So if, uh, previously, if patient voice were not heard, now patients have voices through the health watch. So the local health watches support people who make complaints about services and may make report quality concerns to the health watch, which can then recommend that Care Quality Commission take action. So the health watches, we've got the local health watches, and then they will report to the health watch England, which will in turn recommend CQC to take action if they feel that any service is not going to standard. In addition, the local NHS bodies, including the general practice, hospital trust, and commissioning groups are expected to support their own patient engagement groups initiatives. So the Department of Health owns NHS Choices, the primary website for pub public information about location and quality of health services, health conditions, and other information, and offers a platform for user feedback. So as far back as they are uh, trying to be a mouthpiece they can also have a platform where feedback will be given on all services. Right. So I've spoken a lot about the Care Quality Commission, so we just brush over this slide. Right. It's all about regulation. All institutions under the NHS are inspected or audited by the Care Quality Commission. That is all their rule. So if there's any poorly performing trust or hospital, or care home, they can either sanction you, um, decide that you pay fine, or they close you down, depending on the magnitude of 
the lapses that they may find. Now, what is being done to promote delivery system integration and care coordination as part of practice? Now, general practitioners increasingly work in multi-partner practices that employ nurses and other clinical staff who carry out much of the routine monitoring of patients and long-term conditions. Right. This practice also contains some features of medic medical home that is, they direct patients to specialists in hospitals or to community-based professionals like dietitians and community nurses and hold treatment records of their patients. So uh, the multi-partnership that is introduced now to promote integration is that if you go to surgeries at the moment, we have the physios over there, with the dietitians over there. We have a lot of professionals coming together to make sure that they'll be able to provide the best uh, possible care in an integrated way. And now um, there is also a, 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 a linkage between primary care and secondary care so that data will be shared as all a, a means of promoting uh, the delivery and integration and coordination of care. Because sometimes patients are referred from primary care to secondary care and they are lost, especially cancer patients. And if the patient is, um, let's say, stage three or stage four, once the patient is referred and secondary care takes over, there's no coordination at all, especially if the patient is, is on the path of palliative care or end of life care. Now, there's a coordination. GP surgeries must follow and know certainly what is going on. Right, so there's no integration and coordination of what? Care in the NHS, and they are all part of measures that are used to implement healthcare policy in England. Right. We will skip this slide. That is an explanation of what I've already given. Right. How are costs contained? Containment of costs in the NHS. Uh, the NHS budgets are set at national level. Why? Because they are publicly funded. They usually on three-year cycle. So every two, three years, they have their budget being rolled out. The clinical commissioning groups are located funds by NHS England, which closely monitor their financial performance to avoid overspending. And they are expected to achieve financial balance each year. So. With the current commissioning groups, the fact that they've commissioned them and they have the right to spend in the area that they think that are necessary does not mean that they can overspend. Right? They are still checking balances to make sure that they achieve financial balance each year. The current economic situation has resulted in a large static energy budget, but demand continues to rise. This is actually true because. Um, since uh, the consecutive government in Cameron's time decided to balance the books of the government, we have this austerity measures, which uh, budget cuts. In fact, it wasn't the NHS alone. Across board, all sectors in the country suffer from the budget cuts. And that means that funding for commissioning has all been reduced. However, demand for services keep on increasing. And that is the reason why we might end up seeing long waiting times in the NHS. And uh, sometimes uh, few uh, nurses doing jobs that more nurses should have done. So government funded health spending in England fell in 2010-2011, but has since risen since then to a total of 105 billion in 2012. The projected gap between the anticipated funding and the demand was quantified in 2010 as about 20 billion, requiring savings of that magnitude to be achieved over four years up to 2014-2015 to cope with the rising demand. Even though funds are cut, demand for services keep on increasing. All right. What major innovations and reforms have been introduced so far? I think I've 
explain that a bit, but let's go over it. What major innovation and reforms have been made or have been introduced? Now we have the purchasing and regulatory structures of the NHS, which have been significantly reformed. Purchasing, which is the same as the commissioning, giving them powers to buy what they think is relevant in their area and how to spend. At the same time, the powers CQC has been enhanced. So there are streamlined regulations that all uh, health service facilities are supposed to abide by. And it is backed by the Health and Social Care Act 2012. So that anybody that goes contrary to that is going against the legislation of 2012. Now, uh, before 2012, we had about 150 primary care trusts. All these trusts, which are called PCT, which is primary care trusts, have been reformed into clinically commissioning groups, CCG. So now you will never see PCT anywhere. PCT is primary care trust. It's now been abolished. Why? There are all reforms. Because the trusts are there, they don't have the powers to use the money to the area that is most needed. So the, the, the critical commissioning groups, which is the CCGs, have now replaced the PCTs. So currently, there are about uh, 211 across England. With the goal of achieving, or having these clinically led bodies make better use of resources in decisions about planning and purchasing the wide range of care for their local populations. So instead of the former primary care trust, which have about 150 of them, they have dissolved them because they were not effective. They sit down for the government to direct them as to what to do. So they've replaced them with clinical commissioning groups, which is CCG. So CCG has now replaced the PCTs across England. And they've not been given the powers to commission services that they think they need. These are innovations that have been introduced after 2012. NHS England was created to give those involved in the day-to-day -day running of the NHS more freedom from government ministerial intervention. It means that the CCGs have more freedom from ministerial intervention because they can decide which area they think is needed and they spend more money there. The reform also emphasizes that all hospitals will become the most uh, uh, semi-autonomous foundation trust and that clinical commissioning groups will have more freedom to commission different kind of providers, including the NHS private and voluntary sector providers, and the overall regulation provided by monitor, monitor's expanded role. Consumer and public scrutiny will be enhanced through the new health watch bodies. So now, the reform is such that within a short period of time, maybe by 2025, we should move so that all hospitals become a foundation trust, so that they will have autonomy. Currently, it's semi-autonomous. But we believe that by 2025, we'll have full autonomy, where they will all attain the status of what? A foundation trust, so that they can have the powers to use their money and to do whatever they want to do. Uh, even though these reforms are introduced, it is too early to assess the full impact of the reforms. Now, the last bit of the learning outcome that we will look at before we finish this lecture is to look at practical barriers to the provision of healthcare in the national context. Practical barriers. Practical barriers. Um, one of them is accessibility in terms of social and transport issues. Um, these uh, barriers, even though are a bit uh, visible in the UK, it's more visible outside the UK. Um, different, uh, although the NHS is free and everybody can access it, uh, people 
with a higher social status tend to have access to everything they want because they can choose to go to the private and have any best service that they want. So and in terms of that, you could see that those in the lower social strata in society, even though the services are available, they may not be accessible because there's difference between availability and accessibility, right? And this is very pronounced if you go to uh, developing countries. There are hospitals all over, but a poor peasant will not be able to assess it because of the person's social strata. Apart from that, uh, in terms of transport, I don't think transport is an issue in the UK, but again, if you go outside UK, transport is a problem. People live far, far off, and they have to travel to access health services. And there are instances in some developing countries where pregnant women need to be carried in the wheelbarrow to travel long distance before they can have access to health care. So you could see that health care may be accessible, but it may not be available to different people because of the, uh, the, uh, the status in society or because of distance in terms of transport. And of course, uh, the only thing that you can say about the UK is that still, even though it's free, uh, people are in the, uh, in the, in the high the high the, the hierarchy of the social status the middle class have more access they have easy access let me say easy access than uh, somebody uh, as a working class person so transport per se is not an issue that can be a barrier because even in terms of uh, ringing 999 for ambulance to come in they are all quite easy, even though there are still areas within the UK where it is difficult even to get the ambulance to come in and it actually take time. Right. Now, other particular barrier as far as provision of healthcare in the national context is concerned is funding. Now, I have already highlighted on funding. In fact, um, cost of treatment, either private, have insurance, are uh, all issues that need to be looked at. What I want you to look at in terms of funding is number one, the austerity and funding cut. In fact, there are so many services that have been withdrawn. If you want to get them, you can go to private if you have money. All because of what? Funding issues. So number one, we've got funding cut as a result of the authority measures. Some frontline services have been removed, um, leading to a shortage of staff, long waiting time. Those are all issues that boils down to funding and the authority measures introduced. Um, in terms of cost of treatment, in the UK, uh, prescriptions are paid for as long as you qualify, and at the beginning of the lecture, uh, I, I said that children, uh, pregnant mothers, and people who are old, sister, and above are all having uh, free uh, treatment. But apart from that, the others have to pay uh, part of their treatment. If you are written prescription, you have to go and pay for it. So these are all issues that may impact or serve as a barrier to the provision of health care, even in the UK. And then the, the issue of private health insurance cost is very, very, very expensive. So it's not everybody that can go in to the private sector. You have to re rely on the NHS. No matter how long you're going to wait, you have to wait if you don't have access to private health insurance so that you'll be able to assess private health services. What about the issue of safety? Again, the issue of safety uh, is minimal in the UK. But if you look at uh, other 
context in developing countries in other parts of the world. Safety is a major barrier to access to healthcare. For example, in war zones, in comfort areas, and in areas facing natural disasters, safety is a typical barrier to uh, uh, assess health care. So the health services will be available, but they may not be accessible to individuals because of either their social status, transport issues, the treatment costs, private health insurance, whether the area is in a war or conflict zone, or whether the area is facing a natural disaster. These are all areas that can be looked at as barrier. So if you look at the last learning outcome, which is um, last attack the analyzing the particular barriers to provision of health care in the national context. You can use in the uh, national context to explain, right? If you have got any experience, if any other country that you can use, use them. And uh, I've got um, a sample of the task that I will email to you uh, individually to have a look at. Because from the conversation that uh, Joseph and Christina had, when the system was failing the other time, you could see that uh, there are issues that need to be looked at in terms of how to organize the materials, how to sort things on the internet, and uh, some of you being away for some time and coming back to education. So I will try and support that and give you a sample, uh, a sample task as a guide that you will be able to look at it and see how you can start uh, your assignment or learning outcome one, learning outcome two, and outcome three. We will lead learning outcome four and five uh, next week, and I believe we'll be able to finish. So I would like you to see how best you can try working on what we've covered so far and those who were not able to join in for learning outcome one and learning outcome two. We got the recording on or Moodle, and the sample assignment that I will email to you individually, because I can't put it on Moodle, but I can email it to you individually. Have a look at it. It's a typical okay. assignment. Yeah. I don't have a learning outcome 1.4 or 1.5. You have what? Well, you, you've just said we've just done this is learning outcome one. And we've done 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 today. I don't yes. have a learning outcome 1.4 or 1.5. No, what, we, what we're doing today is learning outcome 3. Learning yes. outcome, it starts from 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, and 3.4. And 3.4 is the practical barrier that I've just uh, discussed at the end of the lecture, right? The 3 so next week is learning outcome four and learning outcome five. Yes. Which okay. Will, which will be necessary, right? Okay. Okay. So then I'm going to email sample assignment. Of course, uh, it's not based in England, but it's quite uh, constructive. It's designed in a way that will serve as a guide for all of you uh, to be able to see how far you can go in looking at the assignment. So that uh, uh, whatever you'll be able to do next week, we'll continue from there. Do you have any question that you want to ask? No, I'm fine now. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to, um, I'll send you the link for the today's lecture, and then I'll email you the sample assignment. Have a look at it and see how best you can make use of it. Is that right, everybody? Yes, yes thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. We do apologize for the mistake, please. We do apologize. If the second time is happening, and any time is Elvis time, there's problem. Please, apologies. Okay, That's no, all right. That's fine. Thank okay. you. Bye. All right. All right. Bye. Bye.